And only one thing, Jennifer Lawless down inside the Beltway, the director of the Women and Politics Institute at American University. We were going to kick off with all things healthcare, but wanted to uh, to jump off with something that's going on here in Rhode Island is the live mic that caught Senator Jack Reed calling the president crazy. He was having a discussion with Susan Collins. She had some comments of her own. It's it's hot mic Tuesday. What's the talk down there, Jennifer? Well, I think it's one example of how bipartisanship is not dead. You've got Democrat Rap Jack Reed and Republican Susan Collins pretty much agreeing that this president doesn't know what to do moving forward. They're talking about the budget and how he has no conception of what a debt ceiling is. They're talking about health care and how he doesn't really have a plan. And then my favorite part was they talked about the comments made by Texas Representative Blake Barinholt yesterday um, about challenging the women who voted against the bill to a duel, including Susan Collins. And Susan Collins, you have made some comments about the representative. Do you think that, have you heard any reaction from her office? <laughs> I have not. I, so, uh, so what happened was Jack Reed said, well, you know, I think that you could take him in a duel. And Susan Collins said, I don't mean to be unkind, but he's so unattractive. And she then referenced a photo of him posing in ducky pajamas next to a Playboy buddy, which is just kind of unbelievable. Um, her, her office did release a statement just reiterating the kinds of policies and programs she sponsors and pretty much ignoring the comments about the representative from Texas. Well, as you said, I mean, you said bipartisanship is not dead, but the, the, the level of of, of language down there right now. Um, you know, I put the piece up on my Facebook wall not too long ago and people are just cheering Jack, jeering Jack. Um, any political fallout from him from calling the president crazy? Look, I think if anything, on the Democratic side, that, that gets him points. Um, because I think the Rhode Island delegation in general has been pretty reserved in what they've said about him. I mean, they've voted consistently against the Trump agenda, and so I don't think anybody has any question as to their loyalty, but they've been pretty dignified in how they've handled this. And, you know, at some point, I think it's kind of refreshing to see members of Congress or senators saying what the typical Democrat out there is saying on a daily basis to their family and friends. And I'm not surprised. I'm sure that Republicans are calling this inappropriate and behavior and commentary not becoming a senator. There, though, they've got a little bit of a problem because when they look to their own president, you know, what Jack Reed said is so mild in comparison that it's almost laughable. Well, it's almost like, you know, the, the gloves are off or there's just almost no rules anymore. We've, we've seen hot mic controversies before, but this doesn't seem like it'll have much in terms of legs. Right. So I don't think it will. I mean, in the past, part of the reason there were these hot mic controversies was because everybody was so careful when they knew that they were actually being taped or recorded that this is where we could sort of get a glimpse into what people might really be thinking. The last six months, and frankly, the last 18 months during the presidential election, we saw this kind of rhetoric, not hot mics, but actually in front of a microphone on the campaign trail. And so in some ways, it's really made this not at all interesting or appealing. And again, the Collins-Reed exchange was just so sort of mild relative to the kinds of things we've seen over the last 18 months that I just don't think it'll have legs. Well, if there couldn't have been a more... <laughs> a day with more news from D.C., obviously, all eyes on the Senate procedural vote to, uh, to consider health care legislation. You added, this was added to the, uh, the list. So as we talked about before, of course, we're going to talk about health care today, the procedural vote. As we've seen now, Vice President Mike Pence breaking the tie. What now? We don't know. And that's what's so striking about this vote. I mean, it was a procedural vote to move forward to have a debate on health care. But we have no idea what that bill is actually going to look like. And Texas Senator John Cornyn said as early as this morning, he has no idea what they're actually voting on. So, you know, I think this really highlights how dysfunctional things have gotten around this issue. It's such a partisan fight that the Republicans felt that they needed a win, yes. even when they didn't know what the substance of that win would be. And to think that John McCain actually came back from Arizona after this diagnosis to cast a vote that would allow the Republicans to move forward on removing health care for millions of Americans is kind of appalling. And the comparisons to Ted Kennedy are just so inaccurate that it's kind of galling. And talk to us a little bit those, about those comparisons, Jennifer. What, what is the talk down there uh, about well, McCain and Kennedy? Right. So as you know, a lot of viewers might recall, it was Ted Kennedy in 2009, right after a brain cancer diagnosis, 
who helped push forward Obamacare and came back to D.C. to cast a vote, um, the, one of the um, most pivotal votes in the, to move forward with the Affordable Care Act. And he was basically trying to fulfill a lifelong goal of bringing universal health care to all Americans. And he was maverick-ish, right? And he was sort of seen as a lion of the Senate. And he was also into deal making. And John McCain has a lot of those same attributes. And then, of course, he's diagnosed with a very similar kind of brain cancer. So I think there's been this, um, you know, sort of inclination to draw these comparisons. Oh my gosh! Now John McCain is coming back to D.C. to make health care his legacy. The problem, of course, is that John McCain was casting a vote to undo the Affordable Care Act. And it's a little bit disingenuous, I think, for people to say that, oh, this is exactly what we would expect, you know, from this kind of lion of the Senate. Well, it is interesting. Obviously, we saw the outpouring of support, uh, the bipartisan outpouring of support when Senator McCain got that diagnosis. And then now we see what took place today. Do we think that that goodwill might be... Is it still sort of the third rail? Is there sort of, you can't really touch him, he's actually quite ill? I don't think so, um, especially because he came back to cast the vote, right? And so by not casting, and it turned out to be the deciding vote, right? If he wouldn't have been there, um, this wouldn't have passed. Mike Pence would not have cast a, a deciding vote. And so it's very difficult, I think, um, you know, for sympathy about his personal circumstances, which certainly, you know, is important to transcend this notion of you just voted to potentially take away health care from 23 million people. So as you said, we don't know what's next. Do we expect to get some sort of indication in the coming days? I think so. Over the course of the next few days, I think we're going to see several versions of what a debate would look like, what a substantive debate would look like, what kinds of issues and amendments might be introduced, what kinds of deals Mitch McConnell and perhaps Donald Trump are trying to cut with Republicans to move things forward. But I do think something important to keep in mind here is that last week when Donald Trump publicly shamed Dean Heller in Nevada for potentially saying that he would not support health care, it seems to have worked because Heller voted in favor of the procedural vote. Whereas last week, if that vote would have been cast, it's unlikely that that would have happened. So we always talk about the news cycles going on both in D.C. and nationally. You know, one of the things that I anticipated talking about you uh, with you about were Fahrenheit's uh, initial quotes, initial statements made about wanting to duel women. Have they just been sort of pushed down to the bottom of the list, or is it something that he's still going to have to continue to deal with? Well, you know, I think they've probably been pushed down to the bottom of the list. But I also think that, again, in part because of the kinds of things that we've heard Donald Trump say over the course of the last 18 months, statements like this don't even rise to the occasion of much news coverage except to sort of poke fun at him and suggest that, uh, you know, maybe he's not so congressional and he's not acting the way that you would expect a member of Congress to act. But in the broad scheme of things, I just think it's just not a huge deal. So one of the things I wanted to talk with you about, since we I missed you last week not being here in the studio, the changeover in the communications office. With Scaramucci, what have we seen so far, and how much of a deviation is this from the, from the Spicer White House? Well, I'd say two things. The first is that Scaramucci clearly believes that it's important to have a better relationship with the press. And we're beginning to see this not only in terms of the way that he is interacting personally with some of them. I mean, it was a little less hostile than what we've been accustomed to. Mm -hmm. But also the fact that there is now going to, I think, um, be a norm once again of televising a lot of these press conferences. So that's one change. The other change is I have a feeling that we're going to start seeing more of the kinds of things that Donald Trump tweets being directly embraced behind that podium. Whereas Sean Spicer, I think, always felt like he was stuck between a rock and a hard place where he had to defend or comment on things that he didn't necessarily think the White House would have encouraged Trump to tweet. Scaramucci seems to believe that Trump is his own best voice and his own best ambassador, and the tweets are a great way of communicating. And so I think there might be less of a level of discomfort between the formal language coming out of the White House and the 140 characters that Donald Trump types. And one of the things, it's been a, a busy day right now, obviously, healthcare, <laughs> hot mics, but the continued protracted, very difficult relationship between the president and Jeff Sessions. Um, you see lots written about it. He's making, continuing to make comments about the attorney general. What do you expect will eventually happen? I mean, we see a lot of tweets come out from the commander-in-chief. 
Uh, but this is, it looks like a particularly troubled relationship. I, it's stunning to me also because Jeff Sessions was the only sitting senator that was willing to get on board for Donald Trump. And we've known generally that Donald Trump believes in loyalty. I actually think that the relationship between Sessions and Trump demonstrates how bad Donald Trump is worried about this Russia investigation because he genuinely seems to have believed that Sessions' loyalty should have translated over into his position as AG and the you know refusal to recuse himself should have demonstrated that he actually puts Trump ahead of the nation and that's quite scary. Um, I, you know, I, I'm gonna be a little bit partisan here, but if Jeff Sessions has one modicum of dignity left, he should walk out and he should not give two weeks notice. Right? Like, he's been, I mean, to, to say it technically, he's been made into complete mush. He's been treated worse than apprentice contestants have been for doing not only what is probably the right thing morally, but the only thing he had an opportunity to do legally. You know, this was not a subjective decision he made. He was not technically allowed to be involved in this investigation. And you know, so I think the extent to which Donald Trump continues to emasculate him and make fun of him makes it even that much more difficult if Sessions leaves for Trump to appoint a successor because Jeff Sessions was a loyal Republican senator. And it's that Senate that has to confirm a new appointment. And ultimately, they probably like Jeff Sessions a lot more than they like Donald Trump. So one of the things we've seen Spicer move on, you just... Uh advocated for Sessions to get all this stuff in a box and walk out the door. But what happens, you know, when these people leave an administration, especially one as embattled as this one, they still land on their feet. I mean, Jeff Sessions, uh, his own career is not in peril, is it? No. I mean, Sean Spicer might have a little bit more of a problem here, um, just because it sort of seems that although he had been a pretty well-respected, pretty friendly, well-liked guy when he was working at the RNC, the sense is that what he was willing to say and do over the course of the last six months jeopardized that. For Sessions, personally, the problem for him is that he gave up a Senate seat that he could have clearly held for the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. um, that's not to say that he won't find a job, that he won't land on his feet, that he won't become the president of a university or uh, you know, very well-paid lobbyist or something along those lines, but you know, he sacrificed a position that he clearly valued very much because he believes in this administration. And when he did the one thing that he really had no choice but to do, the administration didn't believe in him. But we'll and see. I thought today that, I mean, the rumors are afloat that Rex Tillerson might be the next one to go. Well, you know, it's always that sort of the, the, the revolving door down there, especially in this administration that we're all keeping eyes on. Um, we'll see what happens next Tuesday when we talk. Apart from taking a look at what happens now with health care after this procedural vote again, the tie broken by Vice President Pence. What are you keeping an eye on down there, Jennifer? Well, the Russia investigation, right? Jared Kushner um, spoke yesterday, and we actually heard his voice for the first time um, when he gave a very short press conference. Paul Manafort has been subpoenaed over the course of the next week. I think that several of the House and Senate committees will continue to issue subpoenas and hear testimony. The big issue now is, and it's interesting how this investigation has morphed, is not so much as to whether these meetings took place or what was discussed. It's more about, given that these things were discussed, were they discussed sort of within the realm of what we would consider collusion. So, you know, to demonstrate how this has evolved, six months ago, there was complete denial that these meetings ever happened. A month ago, there was complete denial that Hillary Clinton or the election was ever discussed. And now we've evolved to a point where it's like, oh yeah, 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 we have those discussions, but there was no collusion. So I can only imagine what we'll be saying next week at this time. We'll continue to keep an eye on all things inside the Beltway. Jennifer Lawless, always appreciate picking your brain about what's going on down there. No shortage today. We'll check in with you next Tuesday. Appreciate it.